Hi, I'm Alice Peters, and in this video, I'm going to talk about how you optimize your bioreactor process, going for something which is as small as a shake flask to a big bioreactor, as you see here, one that's nearly 100 meters tall. So the first step you would always think about is what expression system to use. And there are more than just the three that I've mentioned here, but I've just summarized the key ones and some advantages and disadvantages. And the gold standard that people tend to, to, to work with is E. coli, because it's low cost, it's got a very uh, fast doubling time of only 20 minutes, meaning it can reach a high amount of biomass in a short time. Now, bearing in mind E. coli is a bacterial cell, so the folding in bacteria versus what we've got in our body is slightly different. So if protein folding is important, then E. coli might not be the one to go for. Then we have yeasts, slightly lower doubling time, but still relatively fast, low costs. And here the folding starts to get a little bit closer to what you would get in mammalian cell lines. Now, finally, we have mammalian cell lines, such as for instance, Cho cell lines, which are well established, where the cultivation process is quite elaborate. This is much higher cost. And as you can tell, the doubling time is much longer. So in essence, you would produce much less biomass, okay? But here, because mammalian cell lines obviously are similar to what we have in our body, the protein folding will be similar. So particularly for, very, uh, for certain recombinant proteins, it will be important to use mammalian cell lines just because of that. Now, once you've decided on your expression system, you need to think about what media you're going to use. And then based on that, you need to think about the reactor and the kind of the type of cultivation you're going to use. And a really important aspect to consider is whether your cells are shear sensitive. So plant and animal cells tend to be more sensitive to shear. So that's important later on, like because obviously in your bioreactor, you probably need some agitation to mix your nutrients and your oxygen. Um, so the, the impeller becomes quite important. And then also the type of reactor that you use. So I've done a separate video on uh, different reactor types, so starting off with your typical stir tank reactor and then moving towards more bespoke systems. So the stir tank reactor is your, your, your first choice and then you think about, okay, what other considerations are there that mean that I might have to move to something different? So you will have seen that I've previously talked about airlift reactors for shear sensitive systems or for instance alternative systems when you work with wastewater when you have a really, really high amount that you need to process. What you then also need to consider is the operating method. So an operating mode continuous is very good for like very large volumes because it tends to be more cost effective. Uh, and then you have batch and also semi batch and you might also consider separately a perfusion reactor. So all of these things you need to think about in the beginning uh, before you decide on your bioreactor. If you think about a bioreactor in general, what, what, what should it do? And then it kind of comes back to the parameters that I mentioned before. So in essence, your reactor, like our, our bodies are bioreactors, they need to provide optimal conditions for growth. So it means they need to make sure that whatever cells or enzymes that you might be using are happy to under operate under these conditions. So then it becomes important to control the, the temperature and the pH especially when you work with high energy systems such as E. coli, where they produce a lot of heat when they grow. It's important that you remove that heat from the system. Uh, and then also the dissolved oxygen is important because if certain cells don't get oxygen, they will die. Uh, and the nutrients, which is often something like glucose. We need probably some method of ag agitation to supply these nutrients. And particularly the bigger the reactor, the more important this becomes. Uh, because you don't want to have any dead zones in your reactor, you need to make sure the mixing is sufficient. And then finally, the supply of oxygen. If you have a small shake flask, then simple agitation might be sufficient. Uh, if you work with a bigger bioreactor, then the sparging becomes equally important because you need to add an extra, extra oxygen. Well, let's consider some different phases in a bioprocess. Now, first of all, you would start with a pre-culture where you inoculate your bioreactor. And what you want to do here is you, if you look at cell growth, we always thought like for like a short lag phase where nothing is really growing. Then we get a log phase where we get exponential growth and then it plateaus off. And finally, it will go down because you will get cell death. 
Now, as you can imagine, you want to keep that lag phase as short as possible because you want like almost instantly for your cells to start growing. When you are in the log phase, um, it, you probably want to be around that phase uh, because there you wouldn't have, imagine if it's kind of stabilized, it, it means that the cells are growing at the, sec the same rate as that are dying. So that might mean that the quality might differ a little bit. If you have cells that are very prone to mutations, you might see mutations that start to occurring. So normally you want the harvest to be somewhere in the log phase. And in order to make sure we are in that phase, it's important that you check the biomass in your reactor. And I've mentioned before that this is not such an easy process, but the easiest to do this is to look at the optical density. And the optical density, as you might know, like usually this is done at around 600 nanometers. If you've got lots of cells, imagine when you're baking yeast at home, if you put that in water, it will look slightly turbid. So you can use this optical density to, to estimate the concentration which is in your reactor. And that optical density is important to give you an idea of the amount of cells and then you can roughly work out in what phase you are. Now, this doesn't really tell you about cell viability directly, but you could use other methods such as looking at the dissolved oxygen or monitoring the carbon dioxide concentrations to see what's happening. Now, starting from you inoculate your bioreactor, you set it up, then I said the monitoring and the control is important. And finally, you also have the harvesting and you will have some downstream processing as well. Uh, because often you will need to purify your system. But in the, the last one, I'm not going to go into too much detail today. Looking at your bioreactor system, a key thing you want to consider is agitation. Um, you don't always need to use an impeller. Um, so there are particularly very shear sensitive systems where uh, this is not used or where you use, for instance, some kind of magnetic system or maybe like an airlift reactor. But for, for the sake of this, because this is the most common, we'll just focus on impellers that are used for mechanical agitation. Here I've shown a couple of the most common impellers and your choice will be based on your expression vector because some cells are more shear sensitive than others and the viscosity. So typically you would work in systems that have a viscosity similar to water, but there are uh, some exceptions where you work with more viscous systems such as xanthine gums, where you need to work with a different type of impeller. And these impellers, they have either axial or radial flow. So one is more suitable, the radial flow, for generating high shear. The other one will lead to uh, less shear, but might have a lower power consumption. So these are important things to consider. The two most common ones, the first one is the Rushton turbine, especially for fermentations and microbial applications which generates very high shear. So that's why it might not be suitable for all cell types, but leads to very good oxygenation. The pitch side blade impeller is used usually at lower RPMs, particularly for cell culturing, uh, and leads to much lower shear stresses. But if you can only tolerate a little bit of shear, then people would probably move to a marine type of impeller. Now, this one has better mixing than a Rushton turbine. So this is why it's more often used for cell culturing. Now, when you then start up a reactor and you've now decided on what impeller type you're going to use, the first thing that you really need to consider is the sterility of the system. And this is a big problem in bioreactors. So when you inoculate your culture, uh, you would need to think about what kind of value you're going to use, but make sure that all the equipment that you use in it needs to be sterile and the cleaning in between different batches is very important. So you would take your pre-culture from, for instance, a shake flask and you would inoculate it at a known OD600 value. And as I mentioned before, this optical density would give you an idea of um, the amount of cells that you've got in there. And based on the expression vector for E. coli, this is probably quite well known, you would need to know like what you need to start with which are known values. And then you would monitor this along as the process goes. In order to follow what happens in your reactor, you probably want to follow some principles which are called quality by design. And if you would follow a normal production chain, you would have like a bit of product quarantine where you would do extensive quality control analysis and you would check whether your pharmaceutical product would be suitable to be used by customers. Now, obviously, this product quarantine will take a long time, so you would have big delays in there. 
when you use the quality by design principles, you wouldn't have this product quarantine phase. Instead, you would have a responsive process where you would look at certain critical process parameters that are actually involved in the product quality. Now, imagine if you've got a pharmaceutical product that the regulations are more strict than something which is just traditionally produced in a chemical reactor. Because the consequences are obviously less if your product is slightly off spec than it would be that it would cause an adverse reaction in people. Now, which means that when you start your process, you need to have a good understanding of what uh, critical process parameters there are. So before you do the scale up, you want to know what you need to control. And you also need to know what window you are allowed to tolerate before it negatively impacts on your product quality. And often these are a lot of parameters, so you might want to use some modeling principles in order to cut it down to just the key core parameters that are important. Now, in order to figure out what these critical process parameters are, you probably want to do some initial experiments either in very small well plates or in shake flasks. So think of, for instance, something where you want to look at what the inference of the pH of the temperature is. That's something that you can typically do on this really, really small scale. Now, normally before straight going to the big system, you want to look at some pilot scale data. And this is more for the process development stage, where you look at least at a much bigger scale of hundreds of thousands of liters before you go even higher than that. Uh, and here you would look at seeing whether you can develop some kind of model and see, for instance, what happens, particularly when you look at the oxygen transfer. This is something that will change a lot going from something which is a shake flask to a bench scale system. What is important to note that when you scale up, the physical parameters always change. They never stay the same. So you can use different strategies, and I've mentioned here some of the key ones, which all have their own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, but the one that's most often used at the moment is the impeller, uh, the power consumption of the impeller over the liquid volume, which is somewhat related to the KLA, so to the, the mass transfer in your reactor. What you will need to know is that all of these when you start using these principles, you will need to change certain parameters. Now, things that are important are, for instance, the mixing and oxygen transfer. So things that you can change when you do the scale up are, for instance, changing the stirrer rate, uh, aeration. You can also maybe enrich oxygen if you want to, particularly when you look at uh, E. coli, when you have a very high density. Uh, and you might want to look at, at a stage where you start to get more E. coli to start enriching the air or use pure oxygen. And finally, then the heat transfer. So there are some uh, cell cultures, again, looking at E. coli, which has a very uh, low doubling time that will generate a lot of heat. So these are all things that you need to consider. So it gives you here in this very brief slide that talks about what are the advantages, what are the weaknesses, and what's kind of the overall impact. So in essence, what it's selling you is that none of these strategies is ideal, and you really need to bear that in mind, that biorex are quite complex. It's always a trade-off between two different properties. Now here's a short summary of what I've discussed. The single most important thing that you need to decide on is what expression factor to use because that will heavily influence other decisions that you will make, including, for instance, what impeller you want to use if your system is shear sensitive, what media, and if you can use a simple stir tank reactor, or whether you need to go to a more sophisticated design. The amount that you're going to produce and the costing of the product that you have will have an influence on the operation mode. So I haven't gone into detail, but fat batch might, for instance, be important if you have a longer residence time. So also bear that in mind when you select your operating mode. When you start your process, you want to do the initial inoculation and you want to know do that at a known optical density. So knowing exactly how much goes in and depending on the system that you use, you want to pick a different optical density. To ensure that you have consistent quality of your products, you want to make sure that everything is sterile and that you also keep an eye out on how the growth occurs. Because as I mentioned, if you go to certain, for instance, we want to look at this kind of log phase, because when your growth starts to stabilize, you might not have consistent quality because also cell death starts to occur. If you start off with a shake flask, and then you might go to like a bench scale reactor, the scale up process 
is not that easy. So oxygen transfer and mixing are always going to change when you start scaling up your bioreactor. And actually nowadays you see more of a trend going towards smaller reactors, but having more of them in parallel because it is easier to control and also because we're going towards precision medicine for pharmaceutical products. So hopefully this very short video has given you some insight into how you optimize your bioreactor systems and what considerations you need to make along the way. Please have a look at our bioreactor process playlist in order to look into more detail at certain concepts such as for instance control and scale up processes.